in the last video, we talked about the scenario where a company, for whatever reason, it just couldn't pay its debt holders. So this is their debt holders right here. This is the debt or the liabilities. It couldn't pay its debt holders. It went into bankruptcy, and it was determined that these assets that it had right here, that it, no, it made no sense operating them as a company. And then the bankruptcy court essentially just decided to liquidate it. And we learned that the debt holders were actually more senior to the equity holders, and they get paid first. And if there wasn't enough money to pay all of the debt holders, then the equity holders got nothing. And that was called let me write this equity. And that was called, so that was a chapter 7. And we're just focusing on the corporate world right now. Maybe we'll do personal soon. So that's chapter 7, liquidation. That was the last video. And in that case, and I think that's what most people associate when, when, you, when you say that a company has gone bankrupt, that it'll just disappear, that people just say, OK, these assets don't make any sense. They can't pay these guys. We're just going to take these into possession by the courts and then just liquidate the assets. But that, that, that raises an, kind of a, an obvious question of, well, what if these assets are, are worth something? You know, What if I sell a SOX website and SOX have gotten an even more popular? And the only problem is I just can't pay all of the interest that I owe on the, on the debt. Right? Maybe for whatever reason, I took out a really crazy loan that was variable rate, or for some reason, I had to pay back some loans because I messed you know, my, and I'll talk more about covenants and things like that. Covenants are pretty much a bunch of rules that the debt holders say, look, you're good, uh, as, but if any of these x, y, or z things happen, we can take you into bankruptcy, and we could force you into bankruptcy. So maybe because of that, I'm in bankruptcy. But it's determined that these assets right here, are actually worth more as an operating entity than they are if you were to liquidate them. And you know, a good example might be, I don't know, a car company, right? So let's say let's actually take this example as a car company because it's very it's very salient to our to at least it was. I've I've heard a lot less about the auto bailouts, but uh it was very salient at the end of last year. So let's say that, you know, these are car factories, car factories and, you know, land and whatever else. And if we're the debt holders, and let's say it goes into bankruptcy, and let's say it only went into bankruptcy, let's say this is generating cash, and I'll tell you, I'll teach you in a future video how do you see what is the cash being generated by the assets, and then you have to subtract out, you know, the cash that has to be used to pay the debt holders because you're paying interest, and then what's left over for equity, and I'll show you how to do that on an income statement. But let's say that this is generating a lot of cash, right? It's generating a good bit of cash, but let's say you know these guys eat up interest, right? So some of the cash. We'll go to the debt holders as interest. And let's say for whatever reason, either interest rates went up or they had a bad quarter or a bad year and they just didn't generate enough cash. Let's say they couldn't pay off one of the debt holders and that debt holder says, hey, you couldn't pay my interest payment or you couldn't pay the principal payment. I'm taking you into bankruptcy, right? Take you into bankruptcy. So it goes into bankruptcy. And in this situation where we'll immediately we realize that you know it makes no sense to shutter this assets if we were to just shut down the factory and lay off the employees we're going to get nothing for these assets because you know the land is in in a part of the country where you know there's no obvious buyer for the land a empty car factory is pretty much useless especially when the other people in the industry are in no uh, in no mood to buy the factories from you so everyone decides that it's in their best interest to keep this thing running so what happens is is that the debtor stays in possession of the assets so you can kind of view the debtor as the equity holders and the management of the company. So they stay in possession of the assets. And what actually what happens is because you know these guys didn't have enough cash to pay off their debt holders, what happens is that they take on a new loan called a debtor in possession loan. And this new loan is the most senior loan. It's called dip financing. And it's actually a great business, although it's become scarce recently. Dip financing. And it's a great business because you're at the top of the stack. You're you're more senior than even the senior guys. It's called dip financing, debtor in possession financing. And what this provides is a company with some kind of cushion cash so that it can keep operating, so it can keep the lights on. So it's essentially a debt. It's just very senior type of debt. And it happens once a company has entered bankruptcy. right? And this bankruptcy that we're going to talk about is chapter 11. Chapter, chapter 11, restructuring. And in chapter 11 restructuring, you keep operating the company. And what you want to do is you want to essentially, I mean, you might do some things on the left-hand side of the, of, of the equation. You might want to sell off some of the assets and all of that, but we won't go into that. Most of what you do is you rearrange this side of the balance sheet. 
And this is why you probably, you know, the air, every airlines have, some of them have gone into bankruptcy multiple times, but they still exist. It's not like when you go into bankruptcy, the company just disappears. The assets will persist, and all of this gets reorganized on this side. And a lot of times when someone goes into Chapter 11 and then they go, they, you know, they come out of it and they go back into it, they call that Chapter 22 and then Chapter 33. And I think, I think you get the idea. So anyway, what happens in Chapter 11? So the assets, essentially it becomes kind of uh, the, the bankruptcy court takes over and they hire some investment. They'll get the debtor in possession financing so that the company has some cash to operate, pay the bills and pay the employees and whatever else. The company keeps operating as it always would. So it can pay its suppliers and, and operate as a regular business. And then all of these guys hire a bunch of lawyers. So all of these guys hire a bunch of lawyers. And they start, and well, I'll, I'll, I'll include just these guys. And they start negotiating with each other. And essentially, there'll be a, 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 a bank associated with the bankruptcy court whose whole job, and it's all part of the negotiation, is to value this. And it's often, you know, maybe. Maybe this debtor right here, he'll hire one bank. This debtor will hire one bank. Maybe the management will hire another bank. And everyone's going to come up with bankruptcy plans. But bankruptcy plans are usually of you know, one or, or more um, varieties. It's essentially just saying, well, you know, we need to value these assets. right? We're not selling it, so we're not just going to get cash. We're going to hire some bankers, and we'll do a lot of videos on that in the future. And they're just going to say, you know, based on the prospects of this company, how fast it's growing, or how fast it's not growing, or how much cash it's generating a year, they're going to assign a value to it. So let's say, let's say that this guy up here, he hires a banker, and this banker says, let's say, let me, let me, let's say this this was originally same situation for this was 10 million. Let's say that the liabilities were 6 million, and that the original equity was 4 million, right? And let's say these bankers evaluate the business, they make detailed models, they, you know, they take it into context with the current macro environment, and they say, you know what? I think this company is actually only worth $5 million. I think this company is worth $5 million. And given that it's worth $5 million, and, and we think that it can sustain, that it can sustain, I don't know, only, it can't, you know, it's only worth $5 million, and there's no way that it can pay interest on $6 million of debt. Right? It doesn't have enough cash to generate $6 million of debt. We think it can afford $2 million of debt. Right? So what will happen is the new company, and this is just a plan, and then once you have a plan, then everyone has to vote on it, and there are things called cram downs, and we'll do that in more detail. But the plan will say, you know what? The assets are worth $5 million. So, oh, I would have thought I was using the square tool. Uh, undo. This plan might say, you know, those assets are worth $5 million. So assets are worth $5 million. And the company can only handle $2 million of debt, not $6 million of debt. Not $6 million of debt. So now so it can only handle $2 million of debt. And then there will be $3 million left of equity. right? And I'll call this the new equity. Because sometimes this can get confusing. So let's just say for a second, and, let, and I want you to think about it, what's everyone's incentive? This guy up here, his incentive is to value the company as lowly as possible, right? Because then he gets more of the company. I think that'll be clear to you in a second. And this guy's incentive is to say, no, this company's worth a lot. So all of you guys are going to get paid back, and then I get what's that left over. And, 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 and you're probably asking, what do you get paid back if there's not, not actual, if we're not liquidating it? And the answer is the new shares of the company. So what happens is, is that this stock gets, let's say this, 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 this plan gets passed, this plan right here. In this situation, these guys up here were the most senior, right? Let's say there was $2 million of senior debt up here. Let me write that in a different color. I know it gets very, there's $2 million of senior debt up here. So what they'll do is they'll actually get $2 million of the new debt. They're most senior. And then all of these other, these other $4 million who are more junior, let me see if I can color it in. I know this is hard to read. These other $4 million guys, instead of, getting, instead of getting any kind of cash or any kind of debt securities for having been owed this money, they'll get the new stock. So they'll get $3 million of new stock. And let me see if I can draw that in. They'll get the $3 million of new stock. So this 3 million of new equity 
will go to these guys. And this unsecured guy down here, he's not going to get as much equity. He'll be, he'll be impaired a little bit. And the old equity guys, the stock's going to go to zero. They're not going to get anything. So the old shareholders of the company are wiped out. They go to zero. And essentially, the debt holders, the debt holders become the new shareholders of the company. These guys become the new shareholders of the company. And you'll often see when a company goes into bankruptcy, but it's getting reorganized, you'll often see some people start to buy up this debt or these bonds right here. You'll see people buy up these bonds because they want to be the new equity holders. They want to, when the company emerges from bankruptcy, let's say that this is how it emerges from bankruptcy, they want to be these guys, the new equity holders. Because usually when you value it, you want to undervalue it a little bit. At least these, I know I've overdrawn this picture a little bit too much, but the debt guys, especially the senior debt guys, they want to assign, they want to be safe. They want to say, you know what? We've already been hurt by this company. They're already not paying our debt. We want to assign as low a possible value to the company as possible, right? in this case, $5 million, so that we make sure, you know, hopefully this, the, the company ends up being worth $10 million again, in which case these guys right here, in which case these guys right here make out like bandits, right? If the company was really worth 10 million, but the bankruptcy court values at 5 million, these guys get all of the all of the shares of the company. These guys get wiped out, even though the company really was worth something. So let's say the company emerges from bankruptcy like this, but it actually turns out there were 10 million dollars. That let's say a year later the company starts doing well again, and let's say that someone could value the company again at 10 million. Now it only has 2 million dollars of debt, and now you have 8 million dollars worth of equity. So these guys. You know, maybe they were owed two or three million dollars before. They got three million dollars of the new equity. They might have made out like bandits because now all of a sudden that equity could be worth a lot. That's not always the case, but that's how that's the view from the debt holders' point of view. The equity holders, you can imagine, they don't want to be left with nothing. They they'll say they'll hire their own bankers, and their bankers they'll probably submit a plan that says, no, 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 no. This company it's worth at least eight million. It's worth at least eight million. So you know, it's up here, eight million, and we think it can handle. I don't know, four million dollars of debt. So they, they'd want a scenario like this, where they think the company's worth eight million, eight million. It can handle four million dollars worth of debt, and so it has four million dollars worth of equity. And of course, the first six million dollars of the value, so the four million dollars of debt, and then two million of the equity will go to the debt holders, right? Because they were owed six million dollars to begin with. And then what's left over, which is essentially so this is 2 million of equity, and then you'd have 2 million of equity here. This will go, this 2 million of new equity, right? This is the new shares of the company will be given to the old shareholders of the company. So that's what the shareholders want. I know this gets a little confusing, but it's all about, it all ends up being valuing the assets as you emerge from bankruptcy. You say, you know, it's generating cash, it's worth something. And then you pay people off according to seniority. And first you pay them off, you say, okay, I still owe you some money, but this company can't can't support six million dollars that it can now support two million and whatever is else whatever is left people are paid with actually shares new shares of the company not the old shares so the old shares will go to zero so you can imagine a world where GM goes bankrupt right now the shares of GM go to zero GM old goes to zero but the assets keep operating and that's why some people are a little bit misleading in this whole automotive bankruptcy debate. They're kind of using scare tactics to say, oh, if GM goes bankrupt, that these assets are just going to disappear. No, they'll just keep operating. If it makes sense to operate them, they'll keep operating. The only people who lose big are the old equity holders, and then some of the unsecured, the more junior levels of debt, will probably lose some money. But if the assets are worth operating, they'll continue to operate, and if the people, if it makes sense to have them employed, they'll keep working. See you in the